Hi, my name is Aaron Jung. I'm an interventional and structural cardiologist. I work at Tri-City Medical Center in Oceanside, California. I'm a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. And I'm board certified in interventional cardiology, general cardiology, echocardiography, CT, and nuclear cardiology. And today I'll be talking to you about aortic valve and aortic stenosis. We will go through the pathophysiology and try to understand what a normal aortic valve is and what aortic stenosis entails. We'll review the prognosis of untreated aortic stenosis compared to treated aortic stenosis, and we'll learn potential options for treatment. As an introduction, the heart has four chambers and four valves. The right side of the heart has the pulmonic valve and the tricuspid valve, and the left side of the heart has the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Heart valves are thin tissue membranes which constantly open and close to regulate blood flow. The aortic valve is located between the left ventricle and the aorta, which is connected to the rest of the body. What is a normal aortic valve? This is an echocardiogram of a normal aortic valve. A normal aortic valve has three leaflets, and the two most common conditions that can affect it are aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. What is aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis is due to a buildup of calcium on the valve leaflets, which restricts the valve from fully opening. Over time, the leaflets become stiff and it reduces their ability to fully open and close. The valve opening progressively narrows, causing obstruction of blood flow from the heart to the rest of the body. In order to compensate for this tight aortic valve, the heart must work harder and harder to push blood to the rest of the body. This is an example of an echocardiogram of a diseased calcific aortic valve with stenosis compared to a healthy aortic valve. The valve on the left, as you can see, is restricted and doesn't open fully, and there's buildup of calcium on the leaflets. The valve on the right is the healthy aortic valve, and as you can see, it opens and closes very naturally. One of the potential consequences of aortic stenosis is left ventricular hypertrophy. Over time, the walls of the left ventricle begin to labor to pump blood through the narrow valve opening into the aorta. Similar to how a bodybuilder's muscles enlarge as they exercise, the heart muscle begins to thicken to compensate for the increased workload. The thickened wall starts to take up more and more space inside the ventricle and allows for less room for an adequate amount of blood supply to the body. As it progresses, this may lead to the development of heart failure and other cardiac problems. Appropriate treatment can reverse or slow down this progression. Other potential consequences of left ventricular hypertrophy or aortic stenosis include an increased risk for stroke, blood clots, bleeding, abnormal heart rhythms such as arrhythmias, and a predisposition for infection of the heart valves called endocarditis, and potentially death. Aortic stenosis is slowly progressive. Early on, most patients don't have any symptoms. Aortic stenosis is a slowly progressive condition, and it is classified as mild, moderate, or severe. The American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association recommends that people with mild aortic stenosis get an echocardiogram, which is also known as an ultrasound, every three to five years. And those with moderate aortic stenosis get an echocardiogram every one to two years. Many patients will eventually progress to severe, which is often when symptoms begin to develop. At this point, the medical guidelines by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology recommend treatment with a valve replacement. The following symptoms could represent aortic stenosis or could represent other serious cardiac conditions such as coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure. Patients can develop shortness of breath with exertion or even shortness of breath at rest or when they are lying down. They can develop early fatigue that occurs throughout the day. They can have shortness of breath with walking very short distances. They may develop lightheadedness, dizziness, and or even faint and syncopize. They can develop swelling of their ankles and feet. They may develop a rapid flaring heartbeat with palpitations. They could develop angina, which is an aching, burning chest pain, which may radiate to the arms or to the neck. Any decline in activity level and or reduced ability to do normal activities is a concerning feature and should be worked up by your physician. It is important to note that the person suffering from aortic stenosis may not complain of symptoms as it is slowly progressive. However, family members or friends may notice a decline in their physical activity or their ability to tolerate exercise, and they may also notice that the patient has developed significant fatigue. 
what are the causes of severe aortic stenosis? In patients over the age of 65, the most common cause is degenerative calcific stenosis. What happens is as patients get older, their valves have been opening and closing their whole lives. Calcium starts to build up and develop on the leaflets as the valve ages. As the calcium builds up, the leaflets start to become stiff and this reduces their ability to open and close. When patients reach the age of 75 to 85, they start to develop symptoms from the progressive stenosis that has developed on their valve. There are other causes that can lead to aortic stenosis, which will accelerate the onset. A normal aortic valve has three leaflets. Rarely, patients can be born with an aortic valve that has one, two, or four leaflets. This defect causes stenosis or regurgitation, which is leakiness at an earlier age. Rheumatic fever is a complication of strep throat infection and is a rare cause of aortic stenosis in the United States. Scar tissue from the infection can lead to early aortic valve stenosis. Rheumatic valve disease can also affect more than just one valve. Radiation therapy to the chest for cancer can lead to inflammation and scarring of the heart valves. This is less common nowadays as mantle radiation is used less and less frequently. Risk factors for progressive degeneration to the heart valve include increasing age, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol levels, diabetes, tobacco use, chronic kidney disease, and having a deformed aortic valve, such as what was described before. How common is aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis is very common. It is the most prevalent form of cardiovascular disease in the Western world after high blood pressure and coronary artery disease. It is estimated that 2.5 million people in the U.S. over the age of 75 suffer from aortic stenosis. This is estimated to be about 12.4% of that population. With the aging population on the rise, the prevalence of aortic stenosis is anticipated to grow. As you can see in the graph on the right side, as patients reach the age of 75 and older, aortic stenosis becomes more and more prevalent. How serious is aortic stenosis? Patients who have developed symptoms from aortic stenosis have a 50% chance of living at two years and a 20% chance of living at five years without an aortic valve replacement. To put it into perspective, the five-year survival is worse than many metastatic cancers such as breast, ovarian, prostate, and lung cancer. When aortic stenosis reaches the critical state, it is lethal, which is why it is important to get it diagnosed early and referred for treatment in a timely manner. Aortic stenosis can progressively develop without symptoms for many years. Once aortic stenosis is accompanied by one or more symptoms, valve replacement is recommended to prevent a rapid downhill course. Possible symptoms include angina, syncope, which is passing out or losing consciousness, and heart failure. As you can see from this graph here, in patients that don't have a valve replacement with the onset of symptoms, their chances of survival significantly decrease. But as you see in patients on the right side, which do get a valve replacement, we can restore their natural longevity. At least 40% of patients who need a valve replacement do not get treated. Studies have shown that patients with severe aortic stenosis are often underdiagnosed and undertreated. How are you diagnosed with aortic stenosis? There are many methods. In addition to obtaining a medical history and a physical exam, various tests are used to diagnose valvular heart disease. This includes auscultation, which is the cardiologist listening to your heart with a stethoscope. Also echocardiography, which is known as an ultrasound. It uses sound waves to produce an image of your heart and it helps your doctor to examine the aortic valve closely. An EKG is performed by attaching sensors to your skin, which allows us to measure the electrical impulses of your heart. A chest x-ray allows us to look at the size of your heart and to look for any calcium deposits on the aortic valve. A CT scan allows us to visualize the anatomy of the heart, the heart structures, including the valves and the arteries and veins. A cardiac catheterization, also known as cardiac angiography, is a minimally invasive procedure which is done where dye is injected into the arteries that supply blood to the heart in order to visualize the arteries for blockages. This procedure also allows us to examine the heart valves to an extent. Devising a treatment plan is a collaborative process by a multidisciplinary heart team that specializes in structural heart disease, including valve disease. A properly trained and dedicated multidisciplinary heart team at a TAVR center can effectively evaluate patients through a collaborative process across the specialties shown here. You will see a cardiothoracic surgeon and an interventional cardiologist in order to 
assist with determining what the best course of treatment is for your valve disease. Consultation and or referral to a heart valve center of excellence to assess treatment options is recommended by the ACC and the AHA valve disease guidelines. What are potential treatment options for severe aortic stenosis? There's medications, there's balloon aortic valvuloplasty, there's a surgical aortic valve replacement, and there's a minimally invasive transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Let's go through medications first. There are several advantages and disadvantages to each of these treatment options. The advantages is that it avoids surgery, it can provide temporary symptomatic relief, you can manage concurrent cardiac conditions, and you can also optimize your heart function perioperatively if surgery is needed. The disadvantages include the side effects of medications, the cost of medications, and the fact that these medications may not improve your symptoms for very long, and it also does not prolong life once your aortic stenosis has progressed to severe. What are the goals of our medical management? The goal is to treat any superimposed disease process that will exacerbate the valve obstruction, including hypertension or high blood pressure. You want to treat any concurrent cardiovascular conditions, such as coronary artery disease, heart failure, or atrial fibrillation. And you may need to limit physical activity to decrease the onset of symptoms. Medications can be used for mild to moderate aortic stenosis, but no medications can reverse or slow the progression of disease. If your aortic stenosis is severe and you have symptoms, the only effective treatment is to have an aortic valve replacement. Balloon aortic valvuloplasty is a limited therapy appropriate for a small selection of patients. It can be used as a bridge to either surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement in hemodynamically unstable patients who are at high risk for an aortic valve replacement. It can also be used for palliation in patients with other serious comorbid conditions that prevent the performance of an aortic valve replacement. It is not a lasting solution. Even after balloon aortic valvuloplasty, there often is progression and worsening of the valve, usually within six to 12 months after the initial procedure. The long-term outcomes resemble the natural history of untreated aortic stenosis. Repeat aortic balloon valvuloplasty can be performed this video will briefly go through what the balloon aortic valvuloplasty entails. Balloon aortic valvuloplasty, also known as BAV, is performed in order to open your narrowed calcified valve. Once the sheath is in place, your doctor will guide a catheter with the balloon on the end of it up to your aortic valve. Once the balloon catheter reaches your aortic valve, the balloon is inflated to open your narrowed calcified valve. The balloon catheter is then deflated and pulled back from the aortic valve. What are the options for aortic valve replacement? The main options are surgical aortic valve replacement, which can be performed by open heart surgery or via a minimal incision. There's also a less invasive procedure called a TAVR, which stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which does not require a heart-lung bypass like the open heart surgeries do. Let's first go through surgical aortic valve replacement, which is also known as an open heart surgery. Most open heart surgeries are performed through an incision across the full length of the breastbone or sternum. This incision is called a median sternotomy. Occasionally, open heart surgeries can be performed through smaller incisions, Open heart surgeries, including those performed through a smaller incision, usually require the use of a heart-lung machine, which temporarily takes over the function of the heart. During the surgery, the diseased aortic valve is completely removed and a new valve is inserted. There are two different types of surgical valves. There is a mechanical man-made valve. And there is also a biological valve, which is made out of animal tissue. The average length of stay after an open heart surgery is about six days in the ICU and 12 days for a hospitalization. Transcatheter aortic valve replacement is a less invasive catheter-based technique for replacing the diseased aortic valve. This may be a better alternative for patients who are older or who are at an intermediate or greater risk for open heart surgery due to their other comorbidities. The length of stay after a TAVR procedure is usually shorter compared to surgery. On average, it is usually one to three days and patients are able to get back to their normal daily life in a shorter time period. Common risks associated with TAVR are death, stroke, and major bleeding, which is similar to surgical valve replacement. How is TAVR performed? 
Transfemoral transcatheter aortic valve replacement is the most common approach. Access is obtained to the femoral artery in the leg and a new heart valve is advanced on a delivery system to the aortic valve. Once the new heart valve has been deployed, all the equipment is removed, leaving a new heart valve in place. The old native heart valve is used as the foundation or the landing zone for the new valve. Alternative access approaches are available if there is significant artery disease in the legs, but the best approach is decided on amongst a specialized multidisciplinary heart team. The following is a video that goes through the steps of a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Today there are two options for replacement, open heart surgery or less invasive transcatheter aortic valve replacement, also known as TAVR. During the TAVR procedure, you may be placed under anesthesia. Once under anesthesia, a small incision will be made in your leg, where your doctor will insert a short hollow tube called a sheath into your femoral artery. Sometimes as a first step during the TAVR procedure, Balloon aortic valvuloplasty, also known as BAV, is performed in order to open your narrowed calcified valve. During the next step, your new transcatheter heart valve is crimped onto a delivery catheter, which makes the valve small enough to fit through a sheath, so it can be delivered to your heart. Using a special type of x-ray, your doctor will guide the delivery catheter carrying the new valve through the sheath and up to your aortic valve. The balloon of the delivery catheter is inflated with fluid, expanding the new valve within your diseased valve, pushing the old leaflets aside. The balloon is then deflated and the delivery catheter is removed, leaving your new heart valve in place. The frame of the Edward Sapien III transcatheter heart valve is strong and will use the calcified leaflets of your diseased valve to secure it in place. Once in place, the Sapien 3 valve begins functioning immediately, with the leaflets opening and closing to pump blood to the rest of your body. The most serious risks of the TAVR procedure are death, major stroke, major vascular complications, and life-threatening bleeding. If you or someone you know has severe aortic stenosis, only a TAVR heart team can determine which treatment option is best for you. Ask your doctor to refer you for a TAVR evaluation. Who is eligible for TAVR? Currently, TAVR is recommended for severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with low or greater risk for open heart surgery as determined by a heart team approach. TAVR can also be used to replace a previously implanted bioprosthetic heart valve in the aortic or mitral position that has failed due to stenosis or regurgitation. The indications for TAVR will continue to evolve over time based on ongoing clinical trials, data, and real-world experience, which is constantly accumulating. There are multiple types of TAVR valves available, and a specialized heart team can help determine what the best treatment option is for you. Over time, that surgical heart valve can degrade. They can develop stenosis or regurgitation. Just like aortic stenosis, you have two options for replacement surgical and also transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Your heart team will help recommend what the right procedure is for you. A transcatheter aortic valve within a valve replacement for your failing surgical valve follows the same procedural steps as a TAVR for aortic stenosis. The new valve will use the old surgical valve as the foundation and will push the old valve leaflets aside. I hope today's lecture was informative for you and helped you to learn more about aortic stenosis. If you have any questions or concerns or would like a consultation, please feel free to contact me. If you would like any additional resources, please feel free to look at these following websites for additional information. My name is Dr. Aaron Young, and I work in Oceanside, California.